So the first thing we were looking at was the definition of what we meant by primary legal materials. And if you remember right, that was a two-part definition. Um, it meant that documents of primary authority issued by governmental bodies such as court opinions, laws, and regulations. Um, and I do want to pull out my copy of Dorkin and a couple of the other books on, you know, what is the law. Um, but I think that makes sense, right? I prefer the use of the word statutes to laws. Okay, I'm fine with that. Because it's all the law, in a way. Well, it depends if you're talking to, under, to law students or general public. But well, I'm talking to judges here, so the, we, the, we the need to be statutes. precise. Um, <laughs> um, judges and general counsels and, and law librarians. Um, and then part B is, is the one that we've occasionally had issues because when we first came in with the National Inventory of Primary Legal Materials, um, a lot of law librarians said you meant primary authority and therefore it must just be statutes. Um, and I'm firmly convinced that, that if you're doing congressional you know, statutes, you've got to do the hearings because when you go to court, and I'm not a lawyer, but if you go to court and you're arguing the law, the first thing you pull out is that committee report that, that says here's what the Congress meant. Um, so part two is supporting documents issued and maintained by those bodies, such as briefs, forms, and hearing records. And, and perhaps an FAQ to that one says this is a slippery slope as we, we move from the heights down into the munis municipalities and, you know, attorney general opinions are, are those um, considered primary legal materials or not. Yeah, at, at the risk of being exactly what you said you didn't want us to do. Mm -hmm. um, I consider legislative history to be secondary authority, but but because it's a product of the government, it's something that should be included here. That's why I say supporting documents issued and maintained by those bodies. Okay. Okay. So that. And, but what was your? I guess I wish I had a slide. I, I'm on more visual. No, I'm sorry. Sorry. Right. <laughs> can you read the first part of your slide okay. again? Okay. So first part is documents of primary authority issued by governmental bodies. Okay. Such as court opinions, statutes, and regulations. Okay. Part two is supporting documents okay. issued and maintained by those governmental bodies, That's such right. as briefs, forms, and hearing, and, and instead of hearing records, legislative history. And we, we can we can tweak the for example list, um, and then again in the FAQ, the the slippery slope acknowledgement that, that that you know this gets harder and harder to define as you get down to your local justice of the peace. And, you know, I'm not sure the, the full transcript of every Justice of the Peace session makes sense to, to have available, particularly if they don't have a record of the session, right? Right. right. <laughs> well, it, it doesn't make sense to say, let's not include these things. It makes sense to take Barney's suggestion of, let's start with what's used the most. And as demand for things increases, maybe the list will expand. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's pretty easy. Um, now we got two more pieces to get through. One is the five non-technical principles, and I, I think a couple of these are pretty simple, and maybe an issue of, of how we term them. And one is that fees for dissemination of primary legal materials are inherently inequitable and should be avoided. Is that not strong enough? I mean, I, I'm basically trying to say I think the pace or paywall. Um, should be abolished because I believe it is contrary to public policy and it discriminates and to me it is a poll tax on access to justice. And I didn't want to use that word because that sets off all sorts of bells. But um. I think it's an accurate statement that it places a burden on us to do all of the cost modeling stuff that was talked about this morning. Mm -hmm. because. Inevitably, when you propose that, you're going to get a response that says, well, yeah, but we've been covering the cost of this with user access fees. Uh, where, where, where does the money come from? Uh, and at that point, you need to have a pretty accurate catalog of where it does come from, either directly or indirectly, uh, or a pretty good policy argument that says, look, this ought to be a public good. So to the epilogue, I was going to add a, um, a, a cost thing, um, mm -hmm. talking about you know the money um, in very general principles, so, uh, but I think that has to be dealt with. Uh, but, but are we agreed that, that fees on the dissemination side are, are kind of the core issue here, that, that um, 
you know, fees for filing fees we're, we're not really dealing with, and, and there's all sorts of, you know, indirect ways of assessing fees like taxes, you know, we have mechanisms for that. Um, but it's, it's the page per page fees or the monthly subscription fees that, that have that, that dramatic effect. And I say it should be avoided, right? Like, so, you know, if it's 100 bucks to get the CMR and I can repurpose it, I think it's a stupid business model because I'll buy one copy and everyone will then use mine. Um, but I'm fine with 100 bucks. Um, you know, it's like for government videotapes, there's no restriction on use. And if it, I, I mean, there's a bunch of DVDs from the government that are a dollar each on firefighting, and they just haven't made them available. Um, and so I bought them all, and I put them on YouTube. And you know, the fact that I had to pay a buck didn't bother me. The fact that I paid thirty nine thousand dollars a year for patents is, you know, on the other hand, you know, a problem. Plus, plus the dollar for the physical DVD. Like the, I thought the Massachusetts statutes talk about, you know, you could, they can charge for physical copies you take away, or for the um, uh, labor involved in finding them in the archives. Mm -hmm. But once they've mounted it on the web for free, there's, they're, they've already done that. Yeah, I mean, that's fair. That's why I say should be avoided rather than saying they're unconstitutional or, you know, or, or absolutely verboten. But, but that they're, you know, if you're going to charge a fee for dissemination, you ought to really look twice. And the fee should be no more than the marginal cost of the... Right, marginal cost of distribution. I was just thinking that but that phrase needs to be in the law somewhere. Okay, FAQ, marginal cost. Yeah. And there we can make clear that we're not against, you know, fees per se, but, but you know, we need to look at their impact, and particularly on PACER. You know, where, where the fee for doing a district court is a couple million bucks, and then that becomes an issue. And that's certainly much more than the marginal cost. Um, I don't want to send this spinning into the stratosphere necessarily, but I'm wondering if there is ever, if we can envision a situation in which we would ever want to distinguish between individuals accessing stuff for personal purposes and large, large data aggregates. So Peter Wynn at Department of Justice kind of you, went you down saw, this you road. Saw exactly where and so Peter Wynn went down this road saying, well, do you want if there were a license agreement that essentially said if you're a big commercial reuser, you got to pay a lot of money, but if you're not, then you don't pay money. And the problem I have with that one is, okay, so let's say I get it for nothing and I make it available for anonymous FTP, which I do with all my data. Um, presumably, West is just going to come to me. Now, there might be a requirement saying that West may not come to me and I have to license my data because I can get it for free but I can only allow it for non-commercial use. And the problem I have there is that's an incredible slippery slope of deciding what's allowed and what isn't allowed. And it really gets into the regulating data business. And we start to get into the situation you have at the Smithsonian Institution in which, you know, their data is all public but you have to ask for permission to use it and they'll decide whether or not you're an allowable use or not. And then they, they tell you, well, you can use it, but you can only use it on your website for one year. Um, you can't allow people to download it. And you've got to impose a license agreement. And, and that, to me, at the primary legal material level, um, seems a, a non-starter. I, I, I must tell you a funny story, which is that uh, Peter first enunciated that whole idea in a seminar at Cornell, uh, where he was talking about it as a close analogy to the way public lands get used for other kinds of extractive industries, and, and one of the people who's in the seminar sort of stuck his hand up and said, yeah, but, but, the, but the Bureau of Mines never had to deal with an army of miners differently dressed and each armed with a teaspoon. <laughs> uh, and about a month later, recap started. <laughs> So you get three laws and no more. Or what, whatever one person can reasonably use for themselves not to be selling to other people. See, that's the problem with that slippery slope because I want it all, right? And I want to audit it for privacy violations. And I want to publish the, the, the cleaned up version of PACER. And I want to do it for free because I think I have a right to do so. That's your, that's your personal interest. Yeah. 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 And, and I, I see myself as no different than a prisoner who wants to, like, you know, take all the, the documents on his case and post it on his blog. How do you make me different from the prisoner, assuming I'm not arrested? Um, so, anyway. <laughs> so principle number two, are we done with one? Is that? 
we kind of generally agree that this is going to need to be glossed heavily, obviously. Um, uh, principle number two is copyright on primary legal materials are contrary to long-standing public policy, period. FAQ, contract, contractual restrictions that, that attempt to accomplish those same goals are, are also contrary to long-standing public policy. Are there any issues with that one? And, and these two principles, by the way, are the primary goal of law.gov. Everything else is window dressing because if the data becomes available, we'd rather they did it. Um, on the other hand, if the Supreme Court can't get it together and we can get the briefs and the oral arguments, Jerry Goldman's done a wonderful job with the OAA project. I think it's better that the Supreme Court do it. Uh, but the core issue is that the data is not available. The secondary issue is that it's not available from the source in a way that befits the dignity of our system of, of laws. But, but the, the core issue that brought a lot of us into this world is that it just wasn't available, period. Okay, final um, point three. Final authoritative text and where possible source code such as XML should be available without restriction. And that's the one that we know we're going to have to do lots of FAQs. And remember, that's two issues we're dealing with here. One is the slip opinion is available, but the final opinion is only available from the reporter. And I, I tried to say this in a way that didn't say commercial concessionaire and vendor. Um, and then the second issue is, is the problem of not releasing the source code when you could. Um, so PDFs of the Federal Register with the XML not being available. Um, and in fact, a lot of people will do that. They'll, they'll perhaps you know, make available the PDFs and then sell the underlying source code. Uh, okay, so that was clarifying. But I have to say that one wordsmithing issue I had there when I first read it is, I don't know what the hell you're talking about when you say source code. Okay. Um, I'm pretty sure a federal judge. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. The, the other issue is XML. Yeah. Is that standard for now and forever? No, it isn't. I, I, that's why I said such as XML. In fact, I'm absolutely not married to XML as the answer. And, and you know, kind of best current practices are actually moving away from XML in many cases. If it's a tabular data, JSON is actually much more acceptable in many ways. Um, so, um, and, and, not, and judges don't know what XML is anyway, so can you, is there a thing you can say? Can we say original format? And where possible, the original format. And you might want to shove a non-proprietary in there just for the hell of it. Okay. Is there any advantage to saying the purpose for which you want the underlying? Yeah, I think I think we need to gloss this one heavily, and I, I think the reason is, and and I think by example, the Federal Register is a good example of that one. Um, I'm worried there. Um, I, I think it's better to leave that one a little opaque. Um, I think that's one of the ones where the judge or the dean turns to their advisor and says, what the hell do they mean by that? And we look at the FAQ and it's got three or four you know, examples like non-proprietary and XML and, and you know, PDF and final form. And, um, I mean, it's gotta be there, right? It's gotta be there in some aspect. This should not be particularly foreign to judges deal with this with the rules of evidence, right? The civil procedure says electronic documents must be produced in their native form as maintained in the ordinary course of Native system. form. Right, so yeah, native form yeah, is yeah. what judges mean when, because, I mean, frankly, this is like half my life is spent OCRing TIFFs from the other side. <laughs> <laughs> we have like 300-page TIFFs, and you have to figure out what the multiple of, because they print out a spreadsheet, right. right, and they tile the whole thing. You have to figure out what, what the X by Y columns and rows yeah. are. On the other hand, you don't want them doing you a favor right? and, and, and creating them. a bunch of JPEGs. Right, but you want the XLS, right? You want yes. the original spreadsheet, and that's native form. Right. But, but if native, I, I deal with a lot of images that start out as TIFF, um, and sometimes they think they're doing me a favor, and they create a GIF file that's suitable for the web. Uh, same thing with video, right? They, they have an original format on a beta cam and they give me something that's ready for YouTube. It's, I don't want it ready for YouTube as a 320 by 240. Um. <laughs> there's, there's one place where you may want to be a little bit careful. This is, uh, there was a period in, I want to say 1997, where very briefly the Supreme Court was issuing its opinions in word format when they had made the switch to word. They were putting them out that way. It went on for about two weeks and then it stopped. The reason they did it 
was that the track changes comments and all the edit histories were visible in the original MS Word documents. And you could actually see which clerk was writing some of these opinions, uh, which made them a little unhappy. So there may be some sensitivity to the okay. native or underlying language there in, in some cases. And so maybe that's, again, one of those, those should be applied as appropriate. So for large systems such as the Federal Register, that's one thing. On the other hand, we explicitly say that track changes on a, on a Word document are, are not necessarily, you know, should be examined um, to see whether it's appropriate. And again, we're starting with the if it's public, here's how it should be distributed. We're not dealing with the what cases should be sealed and not, not sealed, right? We're, we're not dealing with that gating decision. So, I mean, one judge was worried that we wanted the, the written notes of all the judicial, you know, internal conferences released and, and it's like, you know, this is not that kind of a transparency discussion, right? Okay, that was point three. Point four is an active program of research and development standards research um, in conjunction with universities and other groups on challenges such as the automated detection and redaction of personal privacy information, PPI. And I could see a lot of different glosses on that with other examples. Um, and, and would love to hear them. Are there other things we're missing in that kind of point, which is that you should be working with the rest of the world instead of doing this all internally and reinventing the wheel? That's kind of what that comes down to. I, I, I've noticed incredible power from the Office of the Federal Register and GPO working with, with Tom's operation and with Ed Feldman's operation at Princeton. It, it's just totally changed the quality of the work they're able to do because they're working with some of the best folks in the field. So. No comments on that? I do include any examples or potential partners in there that have already kind of agreed that they'd be willing. Are you, are you uh, how about examples of people already, already working as opposed to this yeah. is a list of people we're shopping out, um, but examples of, of Princeton and, and, you know, OFR, for example, and how that's worked out so well, right? Yeah, I mean, I have no idea what this is worth. Real problem there has always proven to be funding. Funding? Funding models. Yes. Uh, that there really is not much available except through NSF uh, without them getting into a contracting process. It's almost as if they, they, they need to be told in some official way that they can have a skunk works and, right. and, and, and pay for it. You know? yeah. Well, they spend a tremendous amount of money at the Federal Judicial Center, for example, and yet they're doing no really effective R&D, even though they're the R&D arm of the Federal Judiciary. Um, there's a whole bunch of other administrative rulemaking entities out there that, that could use some of these things. And, and, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be boatloads of money going to university professors. I mean, I, I mean, they're not paying you to do your, your no, CFR but, work. It's funny, it's funny you mentioned the FJC because we actually added the bankruptcy code. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so point five, I had access to the law should be considered a fundamental right in American democracy, but I'd like to take that out and instead have point five be something like we need more education, training, reference implementation um, to be out there. So a, a significantly expanded program of education for court reporters, IT officials, and others involved in the mechanics of distribution of primary legal materials, education and training, and then that whole reference implementation that, that we could be putting some software out there that others could build on and use. And that's kind of the vision that, that a, a good city IT manager might be able to download some you know, code serving software Right, that let them maintain their municipal code, or that some value-added vendor like Justia might take that code and build a Drupal plugin and and you know support that for a fee. Um, but that there needs to be more in the field. You know, let's let's help these people figure out how to get it up and running. And that's the last of the principles. Um, and then we were thinking there's two other sections that need to be in there. One is um, why this is important, and then the second one's kind of the, the nod to economics. Um, 
so why this is important, um, legal education, right, that, that law students are not getting access to primary legal materials um, sufficiently, um, gloss, pacer, <laughs> I mean, that's pretty simple. Um, legal research is essentially non-existent on the corpus today. Um, there are a few examples like the IP clearinghouse out of Stanford, um, but there's a tremendous pent-up demand for people like Yohai Beckler to access the corpus and, and do more effective things with it. Um, and again, a, a, an FAQ gloss on that one is privacy audits by nonprofits on, on PACER are another example of, of research that is impossible today. Um, innovation in the legal market, I think that's pretty easy and standard. Um, small businesses are not getting access to the legal information that they need today, um, both for serving the legal market, but just as importantly for, you know, being an effective dry cleaner and, you know, not much of the law today is nitty-gritty regulations and, and it's, it's difficult to make that information available. Um, international trade, in order to be able to trade with the United States more effectively, our law should be more transparent. Um, access to justice, both by lawyers and by non-lawyers who are attempting to represent themselves in our court system. And democracy, and that's where that fundamental right thing kind of got moved to, that, that it is the law and we must obey the law and it needs to be available. And, and this, this is an extension of what you said, but I think worth calling out, not just to obey it, but challenge of it, and critiquing the law, the ability of people to say, it says what? And, and, mm -hmm. and go to their representative and say, this is crazy. You know, I read the law, it says this, we, we need to change it and be able to mobilize people and say, hey, Go to this website, look at what it actually says. Mm -hmm. you know, then we should we should more or less change that. Tim O'Reilly gave an incredibly eloquent 10-minute description of, of why, by making the law available, maybe we could debug our legal system, that, that it was incredibly complex today, and by making it available, we could begin systematically walking through that. Uh, Vince Cerf challenged him and said, oh, no, no, you know, this is not like source code. You can't really debug the law. How are you going to debug murder? Um, and a lot of people kind of jumped in and said, well, but, you know, a lot of the law are regulations on, you know, how much paint can, you know, how much lead can be in paint, and there's going to be 10 different laws on, on that, and maybe we can look at them and systematically measure which ones are working and which ones are not. Um, and there's a lot of that kind of examination of, of the complexity, particularly of our regulations, that, that would be more readily accessible. Yeah, I mean, in that sense, it's almost a First Amendment right to petition the government for redress of grievances. Mm -hmm. Any other applications? I, I just like having the words be an, an, an informed citizenry being essential to the furtherance of our democracy or something, you know. Mm -hmm. Who's buying this guy like? Think, think, think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think we definitely go up to high level on point seven. I mean, there needs to be a couple of nitty gritty, what's the problem? And I love that 63 of 66 law schools cannot access PACER. I mean, that, that's pretty, like, you know, Which fundamental. Did you uh, I don't know. I didn't call Erica Wayne. Um, she did the survey. Okay. Yeah. Well, you mentioned compliance by small businesses, but really compliance with the law by everyone. I mean, a huge, a huge amount of what we do in our law libraries is about compliance. It's not about a legal grievance. It's can I take my windows? How loud can my stereo be? Um, you know, how, can I have sex? Now that we have online chat reference, we hear from teenagers all the time with sex questions. Okay. And that's just wanting to, you know, wanting to okay. behave legally. Okay, so compliance by, by small business individuals, professionals, and, and citizens right. is difficult today because it is so hard to access the law. And that's different from point seven, which is an informed citizenry. Um, and so we're kind of doing that point twice, which is okay. Um, okay. Use of the phrase age of consent is explicitly discouraged in this Age of consent to practice the law. Um, and then there needs to be a, a point issue on, on um, I think, drawing on Larry Lessig's talk about why this isn't actually saying we're going to spend a bunch of money. This is actually about saving money for government, um, saving money for small business. 
Um, this is about innovation and, and spin-offs, and I, I haven't phrased those, but I, I could see a list of three or four points. Um, big one being this is going to save government money, um, and it's going to... Mm -hmm. Well, along those lines, you talked before about how governments can look at each other's documents or their own documents. Um, so okay. maybe one of the people or entities that is served by more open... So it sounds like we have one is that this will save uh, government money on operations. Right, access to the law and and, um, and and MIS basically because we're going to start doing things more standardized and the second is is that the process of creating the law will be able to reuse components from from other jurisdictions right I mean, that would theoretically be one yes yes and, and not only that that will reduce the complexity of our legal system a lot a lot less of the what jurisdiction do I happen to be in today and, you know, when, when the alleged crime occurred, where was the bus? You know, it's like... <laughs> other cost kind of spin-offs? Or should I just go through Larry's talk and, and there's been a couple others that, that have kind of touched on these topics as well. Okay. Well, we're at 2.15. Um, next on the agenda was kind of what's next for law.gov and general discussions and, and comments. Um, we can start with, the, does anybody have anything to say about the process in general and where we need to bring it? Or do you want to hear from me as to where we think it's going? Or? I just want to make sure that everybody's aware of the forum that you created and Google Group so that people can keep up with what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So there is a Google group which is law-dot-gov, law-dot-gov. Um, you just go to Google Groups and you can pull that up there. And that's the official mailing list. It's mostly been agenda postings up till now. Um, a couple little occasional spats on people discussing things. But um, my hope is that it turns into a more general purpose forum. And certainly that's where the initial draft of, of these principles would, would get, um, get posted. Um, the, the hope on this process is kind of twofold. Um, on one level is to get these principles kind of put together and circulated and, and you know, things like the FAQ put together and get it ready, get it deem worthy, if you will. Um, I will spend most of July and August going through the transcripts of these workshops and attempting to pull out a semi-coherent 50-page report that that, for example, on authentication references existing work that's out there and has the footnotes that, that kind of pulls out uh, Phil Malone and Pam Samuelson and Jamie Boyles and Jennifer Jenkins' comments on copyright and its history. Um, you know, some of the external research that, that I've done and put this together in kind of report format. Um, but as part of that, we'll also be publishing a transcript from the ones that we have video and the tweet scripts for the ones that we don't. Um, so that there's kind of a big, thick binder that, that you know, kind of documents the process that we've gone through. And then at that point, um, I think the work just begins. Um, because at that point, it needs to go up to a higher pay grade, right? It needs to, and uh, we're beginning to do the politicking in Washington to get folks to take it seriously. And as you've seen, we already have a letter from the Federal Trade Commission and one from the Senate. Um, we're trying to get a letter from the House saying, please send us the report, but, you know, just getting the report is just the start. Um, we really want to get some congressional hearings to, to be put together to examine the issues and call in some of the experts on some of these topics. Um, certainly would like to get some kind of White House attention. Uh, but then most importantly are going to be all these different groups that are out there ranging from the ADA and the AAAL to the, you know, Association of Court Reporters. Um, and that's going to require a whole bunch of people kind of being willing to talk on the subject. And the hope is by doing this as a report that we're in a position where quite a few people feel comfortable to be able to document what, what has happened and some of the conclusions. And particularly have a, a collection of case studies and examples that, that can be used to counter the, the this is impossible kind of thing. And so that's where I see it going. It's a bit nebulous in a way, but the idea is that in September we begin to kind of roll this out. Um, I'll be speaking at O'Reilly's Government 2.0 Summit, um, and that's September 9th and 10th. 
And I don't know if the report will be all finished by then, but I'll certainly be in a position to give a talk. Um, and in that talk, I will kind of be able, at the very least, to put the core principles out there on the table. And so that's kind of the beginning of the rollout, if you will. Comments? Yes, Sean? Question. How, how much of um, all of this is tied to sort of across the rulemaking process, technically speaking, in the sense of the way within different um, branches of government, they're actually creating, they're actually making the law. Do you know what yeah. I mean? And how is that, is that going to get folded into sort of these cost analysis in terms of looking at jurisdictions that you think have done this right? And, so, so the whole rulemaking process is really interesting. Cass Sunstein and OMB yeah. and OIRA are in the process of trying to think and reform that one. Um, there is a um, bill in the Senate now on e-rulemaking, and, and Tom Bruce, of course, was involved in the ABA study on that one. Um, that's been an interesting issue because, in a way, we're on the other end of that. On the other hand, rulemaking is one of the more difficult processes, of, particularly in the executive branch, um, it's one of the reasons the Federal Trade Commission was quite interested in this activity. Um, I don't know specifically how these core principles, for example, apply to you know, comment dockets by citizens and citizen participation in the rulemaking process. Um, I, I think that's on the input side, and to the extent that's the official record, that counts as our loss on primary legal materials and should therefore be disseminated. Um, but, but as to specifically how that relates, I don't know. I've had a couple meetings with OIRA, and I don't think their thoughts are well enough developed on where they want to bring the rulemaking reform yet. Um, I think they're just beginning to deal with that. I think they had too many other issues about you know, the substance of regulations that they wanted to unwind um, and haven't yet dealt in depth with the, the how do we reform the rulemaking process. I think thinking specifically about rulemaking. generating a law, whether it's Port of Communes or like we were talking about the Massachusetts regulations, how the agency has to finally present it to the Secretary of State in what format and how that all impacts this stuff because depending on what format's taking place in, it affects and that also affects the larger costs and I don't know if there are So there's a very, very clear tie in the access to justice world between the, the input process of filling out a form and accessing the courts and the dissemination of legal materials, right? Those two have to kind of be a full circle. And I think that full circle applies more broadly, um, but I'm not quite sure how. Um, and I think we want to focus very specifically on the dissemination of primary legal materials, right? So that, that we need to acknowledge there's a whole bunch of other issues out there um, but I think somebody was talking about how this is a core enabling infra infrastructure issue and then there's going to be a whole bunch of other things on top of that. And I think our strategy for success is going to have to be based on the focus of we're here to talk about how you disseminate your materials. Right? And that has implications on a whole bunch of other parts of your work process, but we are not here necessarily to tell you the executive branch how to take public comment or tell you the court how to, you know, reform your filing system. Um, I said, I was thinking from the perspective of there could be ways they could do it that would enable what you want in the end. And yes. And there could be aggregate cost savings. Well, I mean, there's a very simple example with the form, you know, yeah. you can write the form and scan the form and submit a TIFF file, or you can have a PDF document that's been filled in with actual fields that lets you then turn it back into XML on the other end. So yeah, there's clearly some implications there. The, the lawmaking process, how you author laws, has a dramatic impact on how you then disseminate the, the record of those laws. Um, but, but I do think the focus on, of our recommendations should be on the dissemination side, because that's the fight I think we can win. Um, whereas the reform of, of some of these bigger issues, I, I think, are going to spin for a little while and, and may have many different solutions. Whereas we're trying to do a standard here. We're trying to say if you make the law, you must make it available so in bulk. <coughs> Anything else? Or are we concluding this process? Any final comments? Tom, Phil, anything to say? I conclude this season of the <laughs> workshop then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.